uh, so yeah, no ops coming full circle with DevOps, and this is really the uh, story of the DevOps journey at Cashew. It's on Cashew Deck, but really that's just because it's about Cashew. This isn't a sales pitch. You're going to learn enough about Cashew to get context, uh, but we're going to be focused on DevOps today. So as we go there, uh, first I just want to ask a question: Is this the new normal that? We have things like Heartbleed that come out, and I've got a developer on my team. He happens to be a new father, so he's on bottle duty at 3 in the morning. And he chats, woke up in the middle of the night, going to try and get some sleep after some tea, but found about this of open SSL, and there's this problem. Um, it, how many people here have lost more than an hour because of Heartbleed? How many lost more than a day? More than a week? Those of you that didn't raise your hand, I hope you fixed it. It is really important, uh, but that that was just earlier this year, and then a couple weeks ago we had Shell Shock again. One of our guys who's just kind of chatting around later at night says, uh, "Hey, vulnerability and bash." Previous jobs that I've had before coming to Cashew, we had a security team, and they told us about these things, and then uh, they tell an ops team, an IT security team, and it would just all get done. But Cashew, we're, we're a company of 22 people. Uh, and only about half of those people are technical. So we have all those hats, and many of us wear those hats of security and IT ops as well as development. And it's part of us taking care of everything and actually understanding the entire system, which is important. And I think that exploits and vulnerabilities like this, they're going to continue to be discovered. And we're going to have to continue to address them. And my hope is that taking some of the philosophies and approaches that we have, that other teams are going to be able to take them in stride, and hopefully they'll be non-events. And that's a bit of what we're looking to talk about today. So just to make sure that I understand, who here is technical? Operations and development type side? OK. Um, do we have people who are non-technical? Uh, product, product owners? Marketing? There's always a marketing guy that slips into these things and goes back and takes these back. With, with the latest buzzword to make it look like he knows. <laughs> um, so a quick show of hands. Who would say that their company is doing DevOps? It's an unfair question. Uh, I didn't define what DevOps is, and it's, it's a buzzword. So how can I be asking you to say whether or not you're doing it? Uh, interestingly enough, the guy who was previously the chief internet architect at Orbitz, where I worked, had asked me four and a half years ago. Uh, in, this month is the five-year anniversary of DevOps being coined. The first DevOps day was held in Belgium in October 2009. And so my friend Leon said, uh, someone's going to explain this DevOps thing to me. So in 140 characters, I quickly put, avoiding finger pointing between Dev and Ops, done as not works on my box, or just to get commit. It's running and maintaining that code in production. Um, I don't know, a few years later, given I only had 140 characters, I, feel like that's an OK definition of DevOps. Uh, but I think there's a lot of other confusing definitions of DevOps, DevOps that are starting to, to come into things now. Uh, one is, uh, who here said they're doing DevOps because they're using one of these tools? Hopefully there's other reasons why. These tools are part of it. But tools do not make you practicing DevOps. Uh, and they're 10% they're, they're of the solution, whether it's SaltStack or Ansible, Chef, Puppet. Um, odds are somebody here is using something new. I haven't even heard about it. This space is evolving so quickly. Um, if you said you're doing DevOps, how many of it's because you've got job titles that say DevOps engineer or jobs postings that say DevOps experience? Uh, I mean, there's, there's job posts now, it seems people want seven years of DevOps experience for something that's been around for five years. Uh, having a job posting, worse yet, having a DevOps team is the exact opposite of what this is about. Don't build a third silo. Dev and ops are already at odds. Don't build a new silo. Uh, so this is an Agile conference. So I'm assuming that most people are practitioners of, of Agile. Uh, I, I actually come from the extreme programming background. That's where I did most of mine. And I got to say, to be honest, I haven't really kept up with everything that's been agile in the last few years. But I do believe in what extreme programming is. And I think the, ma the, the manifesto, it's got its points. I think there's a lot of very valid points there. Um, 
Uncle Bob Martin and a bunch of smart guys were in a room when they when they came with that past speakers, Martin Fowler, who's been here to have Martin uh, to Edge Vancouver. He was here and spoke about a bunch of these things. Uh, so these are all great things, but the bottom line is they're about building the product right. They're about talking with the product owner. Uh, they're about actually going in small iterations and making sure that you don't build up technical debt, that you actually track that and bring it forward into the next iteration. Uh, it's all about building it right. The other new hotness over the past couple of years has been lean, the lean startup. Um, Eric Reese, the father of this movement, also a past speaker at, at, at Vancouver. Um, probably some of you are subject to some of his uh, phrases that have now been turned into the hottest buzzwords, uh, MVP and pivot. Um, if your CEO comes and tells you we have to pivot, dunk and run for cover. Um, most people don't understand what that really means. Uh, the principles of Lean are cohesive with Agile. It's really about iterating quickly. Uh, and it's about finding the right product, identifying the right product, because so many startups built products that weren't right for the market. The market didn't want it. And so it was trying to de-risk that. And instead of going and writing a ton of code, go and actually make sure that you've got a product that people want before you invest that time into it. So Agile pushed us to build effectively. Lean has pushed us to iterate effectively. Um, but DevOps goes beyond building. It goes beyond iterating. These things, they really taught us about frequent small changes to decrease risk. Uh, I think this is the, the, the textual way to look at it, and we're looking to reduce waste if we're coming from a pure lean perspective. But visually, I think this is when it becomes really compelling. And Jez Humble and the continuous delivery uh, camp came up with this, that you know what, every time you're releasing, there's change that's going in, and it's high risk. You can actually cycle that down to be much smaller bits. You can identify defects faster. Uh, you're actually changing less. And so the risk is not going to be uh, as great. Um, is there anybody here who practices continuous delivery? Trying to. Trying to? It, it's fascinating. I, I wonder if it's the nirvana it seems to be when you see somebody from Etsy actually stand up and, and talk about it. it it's working uh, for them. Uh, but I think that's a whole talk and unto itself. It, but it does apply to this because more change faster said no ops guy ever. Because change is the antithesis of what they want. Change is risk. And the fact that it's big risk or small risk every time you're doing a deploy, that's change. That's what the ops guy doesn't want. Uh, and can you really blame them, to be honest? I mean, let's take a look at ourselves as developers. Uh, we choose crazy new technologies. We have a new application server. We, as at a company once, we chose Glassfish to use as an app server. It did not have a command line interface for the ops guy to go and do things. He had to log into every terminal with a mouse and click on all 50 app servers. That's not sustainable. Uh, we, we, we force these guys to be really averse to change with a lot of the choices that we make, these crazy bizarre structures of gems and eggs and dependency management hell. Uh, I can understand sitting in their shoes because who here has lost a day of their life? We, we're not even a Ruby shop. We, we develop a job. I have lost more than a day of my life to RVM and I want it back. These guys, they're subject to this all the time because like it or not, we're not always delivering perfect software. And uh, there's, with good reason, that they oppose all of this rapid change. And that's really what DevOps is about, is looking to change that and say, you know what? Uh, Agile's about building the product right. Lean is about identifying the right product. But when you bring <coughs> DevOps into it, it's running the product right. So when you bring them all together, it's identifying, building, and running the right product right. Not being able to run it right makes all those other things a failure. Which brings us to really today and three core cons, three core aspects around DevOps that we're going to talk about is the technology behind it. Uh, I'm going to go deeper into the technology because this is the technology track, uh, but I think that culture actually is the larger factor in this. Um, but uh, again, this is the technology track. So I wanted to explore a little bit deeper there. And then we'll talk about a third thing a little bit as we uh, wrap up here. 
So this is kind of what it's like standing up here in front of everybody here because I don't have all the answers. I certainly do have opinions. Uh, and I've got a story of something that's worked for, for us, but you all are very smart people. You've chosen to be here. You're gainfully employed at, at, at companies in town doing very cool stuff. Some of the stuff that we've done may not jive with what you're doing. Some of it may seem pretty backwards. Uh, with some of the things we talk about with our company, you see where we started, you'll, you may understand why we do some of the things the way that we do. Um, but really, this is, is a conversation starter for today at the conference, the, the panel that we've got later on today, uh, and after the fact. And if there's questions here, um, we'll take some questions at the end. Um, but I think the insights and the conversation that hopefully we can share with each other will help change the fact of ops in running the software is actually something that's been long forgotten as we've focused on some of these other aspects that Agile and, and we have caused us to focus on. So I am the guy that's standing up here. I got to tell you a little bit about who I am. And uh, I think that uh, I'll actually try to, because we're talking about the journey of Cashew, I'm gonna go a little bit deeper with some of the places I've worked and some of the things that I've learned from places that were dysfunctional or were broken. And they really play into the, the role in the way that we've done things at Cashew. Um, Swiss Bank Corporation is it's in Chicago. It's global for 90,000 people. Uh, I built collateralized risk trading software. Um, it was an objective C on next step at the time. People who are all doing iOS and moving to Swift, I actually really love Objective-C and the square brackets. It was really cool. It was the best, best programming language I'd worked in for a long time. Um, but it was, it was awesome. But Objective-C, these were massive programs compiled and linked. Some of our programs took two days to build. Two days. And then we had to distribute them around the world on a slow 128 kilobit uh, secure ISDN line that these things took days to get out there. I was lucky, my, my app uh, that I primarily worked on only took a uh, full clean build, a couple of hours. Um, but what was interesting was uh, I got there and I learned how to develop in school at university and was used to, you know, you're working on your machine problem until it's due at midnight on Thursday, so at 11.59, you're there and you press submit and it's done. Go to the bar and grab a pint. School doesn't prepare us for the real world. You gotta run it. There's users who want that thing. You've gotta report to them. It's gotta get distributed. It's gotta get out there. And so I came in with that mentality of, you know what, uh, I asked my boss, how do we ship the version of the app? I said, oh, you gotta talk to the SCM team. Send them an email. So I sent the SCM team an email, and they said, okay, here's this form you gotta fill out. Do you need it in, in eight hours, in 24 hours, or in a week? I said, well, I don't need it in eight hours. It's nighttime. 24 hours, I want my users to have it tomorrow. And I got another set of forms. Why is this an emergency? It's not an emergency. It's just my users should have it. Uh, so this went on two or three times that uh, after the SEM team kind of said, I don't, we don't know who this kid is that's here, uh, that it got handed off to the build team. Because the build team actually had to take it out of the SEM repo and actually make it. And then had to go to the release team. Then had to go to the distribution team. And so I got an email to come down and visit with all these teams. And they told me about what they did. And hey, this is pretty cool. I like, didn't know that all that happened. Uh, different teams, different floors. They're actually a different company contracted out to a company called Perot Systems. I went up and uh, continued to do the same thing. And my boss comes to me and says, I got an email. Those teams all talk to you. And you're still sending them things to request and send your app out the next day. I said, well, yeah, what's the problem? He said, they told you about what's involved. I said, well, yeah, but it's for our users. Isn't this the right thing? And he said, you just don't, you don't get it. That's not the way that things work. And I said, well, wait a second. We work with these guys. They yell all day long. That is their job, traders. They want our software faster. They want to make money faster. They are able to predict the foreign exchange markets two seconds in advance, and they trade on that and make money on that. Why can't I give them software faster? And it ended up remaining an impasse that I actually kind of got to know the teams down there, and they realized that I wasn't going to change. And I figured out when they weren't busy and was able to ship software to my team, there to my users during those windows, windows when they weren't busy. Um, but it was important to me, and that was why when the first Java project in the company came, I jumped on it, hey, an applet, that would be great, then they could get it to the browser. We know that applets went nowhere, but that was when I left uh, that domain. Really, and it was because silos suck, and I had learned that really the commit is just the start of the whole process of what we build, getting it out to our users. There's a whole lot more. 
Um, and so that's when I followed Java and went to do dot bomb consulting. But in the late 90s, we worked on all kinds of crazy, stupid ideas people got wicked amounts of money for. The biggest thing that came out of it was after being our company being kicked out of a couple of projects because we had, we had good software that we built. Uh, it actually worked. It just wasn't what we sold. Uh, we brought in Kent Beck and he talked to the company about extreme programming and we actually started to change the business to actually follow the principles that, that Kent was saying. I mean, you know what, let's not have a long-term contract. Let's just sign up with people and we'll deliver value every two weeks in an iteration. And that's the way that this, this really should work. Um, so I started to learn about unit testing, short iterations, um, and planning with the product owner for the win. It's just awesome. And this was the way that I knew that I wanted to work uh, in the future. Uh, but being a consultant really sucked. You never really were a part of something. And when you got kicked out just before launch all the time, you didn't really feel like you'd had a hand in it. Uh, it wasn't something you went to go and brag about. So I went to a startup of my own where we developed a mobile presentation server, which this is in the early 2000s or 2000. And there were so many different types of feature phones. They all had their own browsers, uh, WML, HTML, all these different formats for rendering uh, that people were writing a dedicated application for every single phone. And it sounds like we're back there today with iOS and Android and Windows, but it was far worse back then. Uh, and it meant that uh, we wrote this, this application that basically you defined your application once we could render it to all those devices. But we had all those devices in our office. There was no way to do test-driven development. There was no way to automate them. QA sucked when we did a release because we all sat with a dozen phones on our desk and we ran through the same silly little applications on our desk. And I realized, you know what, automation is where this has got to be. Um, if I'm ever doing something like this in the future, I need to have automation. Um, but this is another interesting place because the first day when we walked in, I'd been a Windows user. I had Linux that I installed on a, a desktop computer from 32 floppies of Slackware uh, when I was in university. But these guys set a computer that had shipped from Dell without anything on it and a Red Hat install CD. I said, welcome to the company. What do I do first? Uh, I didn't know about networking. It was a great way to jump into the deep end and learn. And I learned that there was a whole lot more than the app servers and the Python VM. Uh, there was so much more on that computer to get it running. Uh, we learned a lot about it in, in school, but these were all things that now I had to actually run it. And it was a great way to actually meet the other people in the, in the startup because most of us had been in the same situation. It was the founder who said, we're gonna run on our desktops when we run in the data center. You guys need to learn this. Um, and so we all helped each other out. Um, but after 9-11, uh, there was no money for mobile. It was disaster recovery and security products, and so we ended up shuttering. Um, but still, some of my most valuable lessons around manual testing uh, is something you've got to kill, and that there's so much more than the JVM or the app server. Um, and I ended up landing then at Orbitz, where it was a wild ride. Uh, we powered Orbitz cheap tickets, but also most of the major airline sites, American Airlines, Northwest Airlines, crazy, crazy schedule because we'd started five years later than the competition of Travelocity and Expedia. Uh, and when we started, uh, when I was there, we were releasing every week and we thought we were gonna die. I was one of the people who said, let's go to a two week iteration. Before I left, we'd slid to 13 week cycles, release cycles. We probably had introduced another five environments because Everybody knows if we have another environment that's locked down a little more than the next one, quality is going to go up. If we extend the iteration, of course, quality is going to go up. Continuous degradation of quality. We just about imploded. Um, we tried to experiment with virtualization so we could get these uh, additional environments. That was just another layer of things to show up as differences. It was a recipe for disaster. All we were doing was taking developers and moving them further away from the running production environment and that was wrong. Uh, it also was kind of crazy because we ran thousands, not one or two, but thousands of physical servers in order to run the site and do all the searches. Uh, you know, I would always thought about the excitement of picking up a computer when you order it, plug it in, get the networking cable and everything. Yet there were guys who were dedicated to just cabling 
racks, guys who are dedicated to installing servers in the racks. Um, when you needed computers for a project, you realized that you needed to order them three months in advance was probably good, but more like six months in advance if you were going to get them. And oftentimes when you got them, every single server was its own beautiful little snowflake. You thought it was the same, but it was slightly different. And you would spend time troubleshooting that or troubleshooting the networking gear because something was a half duplex. It was really complex. There was this whole other system of the networking in the data center that I had never even contemplated. Um, the, the other thing that really came out of this was we would it required downtime to deploy the orbits.com website. And so we did some analysis. And people don't buy blank tickets generally on Friday night at about 11 PM, at least Chicago time. So that's when we deployed. And initially, it wasn't bad. But after a few years in, the deploy started at 11 on Friday. We might, we might still be at the office on Monday. It was that bad. We, there was one guy by the name of Carl, who was our ops hero, that he was the one who always seemed to get us through. And he was the one that we always called out at company meetings. We gave him plane tickets. We gave him awards. Um, Carl is the devil. Don't ever have a Carl at your place. You've got something screwed up if you've got a Carl. Uh, no heroes was really the biggest thing that I came from that. Because again, Carl was this special, magical guy that all of us worshipped because he knew how to do the right incantation. But really, Carl was making up for us not doing our jobs. We should know how our systems run in production. And after that is when I needed a little time off. Uh, I rode my bike from Mexico to Canada and spent a lot of time in fresh mountain air. Does the mind and body good and decided it's time to pick up and move to Vancouver and find a way to restore work-life balance, which put me at Pulse Energy, which we might have people from here in, uh, in, at the conference today. Then we did energy management software for commercial buildings. Uh, and really, this is when big data, cloud, was starting to come online. And our founder was talking about, we want to be in a million buildings. And the way we were going to do that was we were going to measure the commercial energy usage in a million buildings. And we were going to go put a computer on site in every single one of those buildings. So oh my god, it's not just a controlled environment like a data center now. It's some closet that sits in every single janitorial closet in UBC <laughs> or something where it's going to be kicked. And network connectivity is going to go up and down. How are we going to update these machines? Uh, we really started to look at what's the best way to provision servers, keep them up to date. And that's when I started to look at, at Puppet. Um, and, and at that time, we kind of deployed it. And while it was an, a great goal to think about a million buildings, it was a huge sigh of relief when the founders said, you know what, that's the slow way to get there. The better way is let's go talk to utilities like this Hydro. We will bring all the data from the utility and then we'll just bring it to our data center. We don't have to deploy everywhere. So that was when we really started to look at how do we bring up massive clusters and Cassandra clusters to actually manage all these servers that's required to deal with data. Um, and that really, those are lessons that bring us to today of I'm at Cashew and over the past couple years what we've done. But in summary, unit testing good, manual testing bad. The commit is just the start. They don't teach you that in school. Uh, you just look to get that machine problem turned in. There's so much more than whatever the thing is that's just running your code. Uh, and virtualization and cloud has turned things on their ear. So I haven't actually said what Cashew does. Our CEO likes to say we deliver peace of mind for small business owners. And really, we do that by there's a couple of problems that most small business owners have of invoicing, tracking expenses, being able to file their taxes, maybe paying payroll. We try and fill that pain point and deliver it for them, and then magically in the back end, we kind of end up doing their accounting, which is something they don't really want to do. I mean, people have bought QuickBooks when they've started a small business in the past because they're starting a small business and you're supposed to buy QuickBooks. That CD sits on the shelf and they never install it, or they do when they're confused. And nobody goes and does accounting. They're running a small business. They've got other things to do. So that's really where Cashew comes in, is we look to be mobile and web-based cloud accounting for small businesses, so people with less fewer than 10 employees. We started in 2008, um, basically because the founder said, uh, you know what, when the accountant called him and said, bring over your QuickBooks file on a thumb drive, 
He said, you must be crazy. What smoke are you, what crap are you smoking? Like, this is the days of the internet. Like, we, we can transfer this file. And uh, he said, you know what, really we should actually be able to work on it together because he wasn't going to make changes while the accountant had it. And so, he, like any good technologist, he said, this is a problem, it needs a solution. I can do it in three months. 14 months later, he launched Clarity Accounting. Uh, it wasn't an easy problem space, but he did it. He, he nailed it. And the company was acquired. And shortly thereafter, uh, he decided, you know what, he and his wife had founded it. Um, they were ready to move on. And the acquirers brought in a CEO, brought in a couple more people, brought me in. And we said, you know what, we're not going to be stand out in the accounting space unless we do something different. And so the day after the iPad was announced, we launched that we were going to, or we announced we were going to be the very first iPad, fully functioned accounting software for small business on the iPad. And we went to build that dream uh, and continue to do that to this day. Um, so it was about that time that I, that I came in, and now we're a team of 22, mostly based in Vancouver. Um, we have nine developers, two iOS, one front end, five Java, a product owner, and then a guy who's part QA, part customer experience. And we also power the accounting sites for these brands. So what's our tech? When I came in, it was Jetty and GWT. Who actually knows what GWT is? Google Web Toolkit? Pretty cool uh, in its day. <laughs> you write Java, and it then down compiles it to the specific browser that the person is using. If you're a one-man shop, and it's 2009, and you don't want to do all kinds of testing of IE 6 through 7, 8, and various versions of Firefox, this is a godsend. Today, it's an albatross around our neck. It makes in the JavaScript world, we're actually sending out machine-generated JavaScript. We can't inject other JavaScript in it. We can't modify it. Um, it's been problematic. Uh, so we've actually started to evolve, and we've brought in AngularJS, Scala, and Drop Wizard. We've run on Red Hat Linux. We've run in an environment that is a hybrid environment of dedicated database servers, but everything else is virtual. The reason for those dedicated servers is really because of where the journey began uh, three years ago. That we were a company, 10 employees, three Java, one IS, one QA guy. Uh, and when I started, it took me two weeks until I was able to get the code base running on my laptop. Uh, did I feel like an idiot or what? Two weeks. Uh, there was over a thousand compiler warnings. We didn't know which were safe to ignore. There were errors. Configuring Eclipse. Who's ever looked at the Eclipse, the options in Eclipse's preference screens? Oh, yeah. I actually started to screenshot those to try and show them here and put them on one screen. And it just was taking too long. I think it's probably over 200 screens. Uh, which is the magic checkbox that you need to tick to make the project work in Eclipse? It takes two weeks to find that checkbox. <laughs> Dependencies? Oh, there's that one that isn't in Maven Central. Where do you get it? You have to go copy it from some colleague's machine who happens to have it in their Maven cache. This isn't right. This is not software engineering. This is the definition of cowboy coding. This is really, it caused a sense of utility for all of us. It was, uh, why, why are we working on this? Um, it did the exact opposite of what I was talking about. It was a binding thing at Curious Networks to install your own version of Linux and go and talk to each other and find out answers. This, you knew no one else had the answer. We couldn't go to Google and find it. This was a mess that had been created in our own company. Uh, the development feedback loop was terrible. Uh, GBT took 15 to 60 minutes to do a compile based on your laptop. Uh, CI server, we had one. It's about where it stopped. Nobody paid attention to it. We didn't know if it finished tests. Uh, it was unreliable when it did. Uh, tests failed intermittently. Plenty that searched for when they ran on the 30th of the month, they expected to, uh, the next day to be the first. There's definitely six days a year that all the tests fail. And if we make it so that the uh, unit tests fail to build and we can't go through further, we're not doing any further development on the 30th of each or on the 31st of each month. Uh, there was just a lot of things. This was just, there were no fast answers. It's sort of like a poor system architecture, some negligence. Um, many of these tests were actually good. But they were just 
too slow to run after every commit. And there had been a focus that was elsewhere, not on shepherding the technology and not making it run. Uh, so when it came to deployments, uh, wow. No one wanted to be the deploy master. Well, there was one guy who had to be because it only worked from his laptop. <laughs> <laughs> he had to be running Eclipse on his laptop to make it work. And accidentally, somebody, somebody at one point in time had deployed staging code to production. So instead of actually putting in some other intelligence, they had actually built a Cold War style check code system so that when that guy started it, someone else had to go run another application that went and checked on the servers, got a secret code, and then put in the secret code, and then that allowed the whole build process to continue. <laughs> Mind-boggling. This, this was the way that things were going. Um, the site had to come offline, so much like orbits, uh, we waited until the end of the day. That meant late night deploys. That means less incentive to deploy. That's just wrong. Uh, that's not respecting your team. Uh, so really, at the end of the day, hope was the primary strategy. That's what it felt like to be deployed to production. Uh, was it going to all come tumbling down? And even if we fix the, fix the scaffolding, though, and started to make it better, really, it comes back to you need to practice. Uh, it's funny, I've been told about this story from this book. It's been kind of making its way in the past couple of weeks. Um, I think uh, Brad Feld posted something that had about it, but there was a study that was done from a ceramics teacher in a pottery class. They divided the class into two different segments. He said, everybody over here, you're going to be measured on quantity of work. 50 pounds of pottery, you get an A. 40 pounds of B, and so on. This side, quality. Only need to make one pot. Just one, and if it's perfect, you get an A. So at the end of the uh, quarter, when it was all done, curious thing happened. The people that had practiced and had built, they actually had a far better quality pot as well. People on the other side had spent time theorizing about what it would take to build the perfect pot. I think there's a, a middle ground. You need to think about the theory. As we heard about in the, in the previous talk, there is the, 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 the pursuit of perfection is a good thing. We need to always be perfecting. Uh, but you always have to be practicing as well. And that was really what the problem was, is that deployments had gotten to be so painful. We didn't deploy. We didn't add additional business value. We were scared to try and add more business value. Uh, some of that came back down to even what we were running on. It was a proprietary virtualized environment. Uh, so not, not your Amazon or any of the ones that you know of. Uh, had unstable and frequent outages. Um, we didn't actually know how many servers we had. The day that we were migrating off of it, I found two more servers. I didn't realize that we had backup domain name servers that we ran. Uh, it was just completely undocumented. Uh, and you couldn't resize or provision more to an API. So essentially, we had all of the challenges and problems of a virtual environment with none of the advantages. Uh, and that, again, made deployments in the system terrible. And I haven't even mentioned users. You know, they're the ones that are there paying us every month. They're the ones that, when something doesn't work, it's just like getting on an elevator. It doesn't matter if you press the button, you press it again. And they break down the site when they do that because it just wasn't performant. Uh, so we were trying to deal with that type of experience without putting in the please don't click the back button type of message and such in the app. Uh, so really, I mean, every day, pretty much felt like it was a fire alarm day. Uh, we were questioning, is it the right thing to do? Um, if you've ever felt like the grass is greener elsewhere, uh, this is what I found when I got to work, uh, when I thought the grass might be greener. Could be jumping to a situation like this. Um, we didn't just have one elephant in the room. We had lots of elephants, and they were hurting. They were charging wherever we went. We needed to fix things. Uh, it was easy to get demoralized. Uh, we had technical debt. Um, we didn't have technical design on many things. Uh, architectural shortcomings, broken processes, and somehow we launched an iPad app that was driving wild success and bringing more people to our site. Um, so it was exacerbating the fact that we couldn't handle the, the, the capacity, we couldn't scale for it. 
Um, it was easy to get demoralized, but we actually turned it around and said, you know what? We're going to eat the elephant, or all the elephants, one bite at a time, such that one guy has claimed that that's going to be what his tombstone is, that if he goes to his grave and is known as that he tackled the elephant one bite at a time, he would be happy. Um, and so that gets back to what does it take for us to fix this situation? Does anybody think that they were in a situation that's worse than this? Come on. All right, well, it was bad. There is no doubt about it. It was bad. Uh, so technology. There was just some, some bottom line, baseline things that as self-respecting developers, it was our obligation and duty to fix before we could even start to think about DevOps. Fix the damn build two weeks for someone to come on and join the team, unacceptable. Uh, having to deploy from within Eclipse and have crazy, no, that does not work. It needs to all be taken out and, and be made so that it really is reproducible. We needed to get to the point that it was one command to build and run after a clone. And that took us a couple of weeks. We tried looking at Gradle. Uh, we tried thinking of that as new hotness. It, it didn't work with some of the technology that we had. So what we ended up doing was uh, I think it oftentimes a rewrite is thought of you scrap everything you've got and you then need to choose new technologies. We realized that we just had some stuff that was bad in terms of our build system that Ant and Ivy, they work for a lot of people. We said to scrap what we had and stick with the same technologies because of GWT and some other constraints. Things that work together, a lot of the new things didn't take into account the way that GWT works. Um, so we actually did a whole bunch of of rewriting it. Um, the, there were steps on the wiki that what you need to do to get your machine uh, ready to actually run, which was interesting because now I think after we install, um, this weekend when this presentation said I'm gonna install Yosemite, I think with the introduction of Homebrew and Cask, we're actually gonna have what's it take to get your laptop running as a one-step command as well. So it'll be one command for that and one command to clone and get your repo running. We've come a long way. I know other people do VMware image or Vagrant images to achieve the same type of thing. It would be another way to go about it, uh, but a lot of us were uh, Mac developers and wanted some of the native Mac stuff, and so we chose to stay that way. Uh, Cashew Meat Jenkins. All of these things, they were manual. Uh, so initially it was just build and unit tests. Even those crufty unit tests that took an hour, we got them running. We found a way to make them work. They were there, they proved something. Uh, we fixed the ones that were just bad tests. We made the system understand that there were days of the month, or months that had 31 days. Uh, we got to the point now where uh, we can actually spin up servers and full environments from one click inside of Jenkins after we get through all of this. And we do all of our deploys through here. So Jenkins has become a cornerstone for us of automating everything. Um, but there's an interesting bit Knowing is a prerequisite to automating. And that was part of what our problem was, is that we didn't actually know what it took to do a deploy. And so we actually started to write a checklist of what's it take. And this was a very, very long checklist at, at one point. You'll see here, I think now, this is where it's at. Um, we don't actually have anything really technical. These are things telling the team that things are happening, putting out updates on our, our cashew status, Twitter feed. Those things, which by the way, the way that we got through with automating is once we were able to write it all down, then we could start to automate it, and every week after a deploy or every deploy, we tried to find one more thing to automate. We're still looking to automate as we go. Uh, one of the next things we've talked about is, you know what, there's an API on Twitter. Why not make that go away? We can, we can post that we're doing a maintenance start, maintenance finish. Um, there's a bunch of things in here that we can still automate, even though we've gotten to the point that we can, it's one click push the app out, it's one click to build an environment, we're still looking to automate. It's been built into the DNA of Cashew. So that was really a lot of the baseline stuff that we just had to get out of the way. We had to get to the point that probably many of you are already at, that you've got a working system, things are looking good. Uh, and Philippe, who is speaking next, just kind of coincidentally had put together a paper that I had come across completely independently in the four plus one view. Uh, has anybody encountered this before? Uh, so really, what's interesting about it is that lean and agile cause you to focus really in these areas of uh, 
the development view. So these are the things that we think of about what are the objects, what are the components. Uh, logical view, what are the concepts that a product owner is talking about. Uh, but because of the way that, that, that that's focused on things, we haven't always thought about what's it take to run it or what's it take to make it performant. It's always about uh, does the product owner sign off? Okay, we're done. We need to consider these other parts as well, and that's really when I think DevOps starts to enter the picture. Um, it's a disservice to the operational half, and the DevOps draws out the focus that we need to have there. And that's where tools start to come into it. So, Salt Stack, Ansible, Chef, Puppet, I think these are probably the major four that, that people tend to say that they're gonna use. Um, Chef and Puppet were the only two that were mature enough when we started three years ago. Actually, I don't, I don't know if Ansible and Salt Stack were around. Uh, I'd actually looked at Chef when I started to work at Puppet at, at Puppet at a previous job. It was too primitive at that point in time. But it turned out that uh, there's a fundamental difference between Puppet and Chef that Puppet has an imperative notion that you describe what you want and you let the system go out and build and get you to that state. Um, Chef is much more declarative. And while I like the promise of Puppet, the reality is that I found that I was writing so many guard statements that I had to make sure that things came before and after. There was a lot of sequencing that happens in building out a server and all this stuff. And that uh, declarative aspect of sequencing in Chef caused us to go that, that uh, route. Would we choose it again? Stay tuned. Um, so we ended up coming down with Chef. So I'll talk a little bit about the way that this works. A couple of key concepts is you've got a Chef server. This is where nodes check in for updates. This is all of the information that says this is what your environments should look like. You've got a node. This is a piece of infrastructure under management. So it could be a server. It can actually be networking devices and things like that as well. Um, a workstation. That's where you do your cookbook and recipe authoring, and there's a tool called Knife that you use to integrate or to, to communicate with these other things. And then there's the process of converging, which is making a node comply with the current policy of the Chef server. Uh, and this is kind of what the environment and the workflow looks like. Is you're here in your workstation, and you push things up to GitHub, and there's some testing that can be done through Jenkins. You know, push it up to the Chef server. There's additional input that you give through the management console. And then there's something called the Chef Client. It's a daemon that runs on every single server that's in your environment. Checks in every half an hour. Says, tell me what I need to do to be up to date. And your infrastructure is all supposed to be up to date based on that. Um, one of the things that's interesting is this is a different process than we do with code. We normally think workstation to GitHub to Jenkins to out here. Uh, that means that this thing here that allows us to put additional data and attributes in is different than what we have in GitHub source control. That's something that has been kind of a, a philosophical hurdle for us. And that we, we did this because we came from a world where we didn't even know which servers we had. We're now trying to get that all under source control. And this is a way for rogue stuff to come in that we don't know about. It's for a good reason. Um, you can put in through that uh, passwords that you want to lock into a database that you don't want in source control. But it goes beyond that. So it, it's, there's an interesting bit that if anybody goes this route, um, it's something to be aware of because it's easy to have some deviation that happens between what you've got in code and what comes into this management console to enter some of these things. Um, yeah, so going on again with some of the key concepts is what you're actually writing is you've got resources. These are pieces of infrastructure that have actions. You've got recipes. This is a set of uh, configuration states that usually define a functional unit. And then a cookbook, which is, they say defines a scenario and all the components that make up that scenario. What does that jumbo mean? Let's go a little bit more specific and concrete. Think of a resource as being something like your mysqld.com file. It can, that's a, that's a file, it's a template file that gets put out. How should MySQL be configured? A recipe, maybe that's the MySQL server, the MySQL client, a MySQL slave. And a cookbook is all of those MySQL recipes together. Uh, it's just a way of kind of organizing and grouping and breaking down some of these things. Um, and then you have roles, which you assign to a node. 
and those map to cookbooks and recipes. So you might have a note that's marked as having a DB role, um, and it gets those versions of MySQL as necessary. And an environment is something that was added partway in through Chef's life to reflect the fact that we all have different environments, dev, staging, prod, pre-prod, integration, whatever you want to call it. Wasn't always available in Chef, but is there now to allow you to version these things at a different rate. Um, so, a little bit of a code example here. Okay. Uh, recipes and resources, so SSH. Here this is just saying, you know what, Etsy SSH, SSHD config is something that needs to be managed. And the source for that is a template file, sshdconfig.erp. Um, when that thing, anything happens with it, you're supposed to restart the service SSHD immediately. Uh, and then we got to define the other half of it is that there needs to be a service daemon running for SSH. So these two things are, are closely tied together, but that's, those are your resources, a service and a template, and they come together to form your SSH recipe. This is another way to try to crystallize these concepts a bit further. You were able to write your own SSH, it's something that's there on every version of, of Unix. Uh, this is actually a recipe for what we call the books app, uh, the core accounting engine that we've got, that we're able to define that there is a Java app. These are the parameters that they can configure. So we have multiple Java apps. The Java app is an abstraction we have that we're able to pass in configuration and we're able to make sure that every single Java app looks the same to the rest of the environment so that we can start, stop, and monitor all of the Java apps in the same manner. Part of, to that end, uh, we use Monit, which is a system that basically you give things health checks and it will alert you when things are up and down. So Monit is something that is its own definition, the Monit daemon. Uh, but it would be really tightly coupled if we were to take all the configuration for these things and put them in with Monit. So if Monit is there and running, and if something wants to take advantage of Monit and be monitored by it, it defines it itself. And that's where we say that, you know what, we need to have a health check, and we need to be registered with Monit. So that's kind of the notion of recipes and resources. From our production system, roles, as I look at these, I realize that we could really take a lesson in more creative naming or more descriptive naming, but pull off uh, something that we use to store binary objects. Uh, and then books for everything that this does with the books app, there's APIs, there's uh, roles can inherit from one another. So we actually have a server that has a books base, and then everything that's in the books app would extend from that. So here's an example when you go and look at, and these are all done from the command line with this utility called knife, uh, knife role show books app. It actually extends the book space role and then needs these four recipes in addition. That it's the cashew app, so that app that runs the booking, the <coughs> county engine, cloud files because it needs to actually talk to a S3 rack, uh, cloud files type store, and something else called copy new files that's there. Um, so kind of how it turns out in our environment, these concepts were right there. So moving to Chef, we called it the Great Migration 1.0. We migrated to an entirely new hosting provider. The automation was nice. It was really, really nice. But that was not the biggest benefit. Uh, the biggest benefit was that we mapped out every single concept that was in our system. We knew what we had. Um, and it allowed us to actually start to break apart the monolith, or plan to break apart the monolith that we built. Um, we had a complete uh, inventory of the configuration of everything, and it was in source control. Uh, but at the time, what was interesting is there wasn't any way to test it. And we'd gotten into a pretty bad spot without testing and without diligence, and without good engineering practices, and that was something that bothered us. So the only thing that was there at the time was something called food critic that allows you to do kind of a linting and style checking. And we were basically manually unit testing by trying to spin things up on Vagrant and see that everything uh, converged the way that we expected, but that wasn't efficient. So already there was a little bit of a smell, there was something here that we didn't like, but there were a lot of rumblings in the chef community that they were going to become test driven. And so we decided that we would stick it out. And so it was a smooth migration, uh, it was great. Except I'm not telling an entirely truth here. I, I described uh, earlier and showed 
those nodes in production all calling out and running the chef daemon, chef client daemon, and getting their new data every half an hour. We weren't comfortable with that. I don't know if it's just us, but I, it's my production environment. I don't want it changing on its own. Uh, and thus, something that was, we just called the chef run, and we said, you know what? We're not comfortable with those changes going out automatically. We don't understand the system well enough yet. What we're gonna do is, in an effort to actually try to spread this knowledge throughout the company, we're gonna pair and we're gonna do chef runs whenever we have enough work that's been built up that we can deliver value and improve our environment where it needs to be done. We'll stop, we'll do a chef run, and we'll pair it, and we'll, we'll run it all out, and we'll just know that at that point in time, the environment changed. The same way that when we release the app, we know that the environment has changed, we have a mark on our graphs that say deploy, and if there's problems that happen, we know to look, is it around the deploy mark? Okay, something in that deploy is probably that did it, but if there could be little deploys happening in the environment all day long, seeing and we didn't discover it, it could be problematic. Um, but this actually turned out to be our downfall. Uh, we got busy, we let inventory build up. Uh, we didn't actually deploy. And at some point in time, fear about deployment caused us to overestimate what it was gonna take to do one of those chef runs, even as we were pairing, and we didn't deploy. And things started to degrade over time, until fairly recently. And we'd, we'd run things when we needed them, but it was actually more piecemeal. We did Great Migration 2, which was upgrading to Chef 11, and we do actually have Chef Client running every 30 minutes. We are much more confident in it. I think we understand the tool a whole lot better now, so we're okay with that. And I think a large part of that is because of the other things that have happened in the chef community in the past two years. There's, there's unit testing with chef spec. Uh, there's integration testing with test kitchen and server spec. Uh, there's dependency management. All of these things that we know of as developers and they give us the courage and the confidence to go and say that our code works, they're now coming to this arena. And it makes us a lot more comfortable, feel like it's a lot more solid what goes out there. I mean, we are developers first, we're not sysadmins. And so this is already a space that we're not quite comfortable in. So having any of this back it up goes back to all of those, uh, if you've read Extreme Programming Explain, where Kit Beck is talking about having courage and confidence through your, your unit tests. This just builds on that. So we have tests that automatically run on pull requests in Jenkins. We've moved to using data bags. Um, and so where has this gotten us? Uh, so back to that shell shock. Uh, when that came out, one of our guys was able to go and run this one knife command and see across the, the production environment, this is a segment of our production environment here to, as an example, that he basically put in what that exploit was and run it on all machines that are production machines. And they all came back and said, yep, this is a test, nothing said vulnerable. We knew that we were good. We had already made the, the, the update. Well, here we've already made the update. We waited for the patch to come out and we were able to run a command that installed it. We were able to look at the version, see that it was there. But Shellshock literally was a non-event. Uh, open SSL upgrade, same problem, or same, same non-problem. Because we have this ability and we know our environment that well, it's been great. Um, Poodle came out the other day, um, the new Google exploit about SSL version three. Uh, some of the team didn't even realize that it had come out and that there had already been a crest. It was just fixed that quickly and that easily. Um, so these are the things that, again, previously we would have waited for some other team and when I was in a larger company to work on it, but we take it on. Um, and it's, I think that's part of the culture as well, is that guys discover this uh, and come in and say, you know what, we're going we're gonna to work on this, we're going to fix it. Um, so we've done and made all this great progress on automation and DevOps and knowing what's going on, but we're also this big iOS iPad shop. Yeah, it doesn't quite work on the App Store. Um, everybody knows about App Store review times, automation and everything that we want to do there. It's not really the environment. However, it didn't, didn't really uh, cause us to, to, to stop, we, we pursued it. Uh, and we're starting to see lots of changes happen there that uh, in the iOS world, Started out with band-aids and workarounds, but now we're making progress. If anybody uses iOS here, uh, there are things you can do to improve and get here. The Apple walled garden does not need to be oppressive and, and burden you. Uh, look to use 
these things and you can have all the things that people are talking about in the web world um, and getting this quick feedback and being able to automate it. Uh, we really don't have any manual processes left except one button click on app submission now. Um, we're able to upload binaries. It's great. And we're able to, to actually have a much better iOS application because we've started to actually close that feedback loop with all this automation. Uh, we did choose uh, one thing there is Jenkins over the OS 10 server bots because it's just we're running Jenkins for everything else. Um, and it's also just what, what we knew. But for anybody who's new to Objective-C and doing iPhone, a lot of it seems like it's in the dark ages if you're coming from Java and .NET or Ruby. It just does not have all the things we've come to expect. Um, and this kind of gets back into the culture of DevOps, but I, it's technical is that we've just recently started an Android application. And so we said, hey, we need to do an iteration zero. And actually we said, you know what, we need to, to go back to, I think, one of the agile folklore stories, something that's called a Hudson Bay Stark, that was Hudson Bay Company when they used to go out on expeditions. Before they actually went on the real expedition, they went out for a couple of days and packed the ship boats, did everything, made sure they had what they needed, and did a dry run, essentially. And that's what we did. And we said, you know what, we need Hello World. And really, we would have had Hello World built in probably an hour. We've got a guy who's done a little bit of Android development before. But we identified all of these things that we needed to do. Uh, that some of them are processed, so yeah, Jira Confluence project, but you know what, we want to be notified in the HipChat channel when there are build failures that don't work. We want to have Kalabash because we're looking to do behavior-driven development. Uh, it was important, critically important to me that our CEO could have this installed on his phone from day one, and it was not me having to go and sideload it and plug it in, and it was only going to get updates when I saw him in the office. We started the iOS app that way, and we were never going to do that again. And so, literally, it's a little hard to see, but because we are a white label, Product, we, we have this, these other brands that we power. The very first thing we said is we need a low world on two brands that our CEO can install on his phone <coughs> that we're notified of every single step of the process, whether it's through HipChat or things in Jenkins that we've already got wired up. That's what Iteration Zero was for us. We've taken that all out and so that now when the project gets to the end and there's always crunch time at the end, we're not going to be dealing with deployment. We're not going to be figuring out how do we get this on all the testers' phones. That was really what the first bit of this was, and that's, I think, distinctly different that had we started this project two years ago, we wouldn't have been in that mindset. It would have been, can we log into our, can we show a login screen, and can we show that you can log into the app? Everything here is operational. There's nothing specific to our app. Um, and I think that just change, shows the change of perspective that we've had around DevOps, um, where it's important to focus. Uh, next steps, we're kind of looking to go blue-green deployments. So we want to be able to bring new servers up and tear new server, tear the old servers down and flip-flop back and forth between them. Uh, and we want to have the notion of feature flagging be more dynamic, that we can actually start to bring components up in the, the, the infrastructure and start to selectively send users to them. Uh, it's a far cry from users clicking on the same button twice three years ago and bringing the site down, the fact that we're now able to think about, could we do this with users? Um, took a lot of time and work, but it's stuff that we can actually see that we, we can do. But uh, there is a question of, have we swung too far in this direction? Um, you know what, updating in place on database servers still bothers me at night. Uh, and that simplicity versus peace of mind chart that we described for the business owners and what we deliver, I think it applies to our business too as developers. Uh, that chef stuff, if you haven't seen it before, did it come across as simple? There's a fair amount of complexity in it. I, I wonder if there's something different that instead of having chef actually talking to all of our environments, if we actually should build up a couple of images because we really have a short number of images. We may run lots of servers, but that's because we don't have a single point of failure because we need additional capacity. You have a dozen app servers that are just there to take a load, but they're all the same image, essentially. Should we maybe just use Chef to build that image and then use something like Packer to bring it together and then ship it off and then boot those up? And we do our blue-green deployment, bring up 12 new app servers on that new image, quiesce and throw the other ones out of the mix. 
if we're doing that, maybe we should get rid of Chef. Uh, maybe these simpler things like Ansible and Salt Stack to, to build the image, uh, and then use Packer to, to push it out. I think there's something pretty compelling in that, um, which, given all that we've invested in Chef, does that sacrilege? Does it mean that we've, we've done a lot of waste? No, I think this is this is part of the journey of, of going to look at how can we continue to perfect. Um, another thing with this, what happens when the next shell shot comes? We go out now, we make one change, and it gets updated in place. With this, would we have to redeploy the entire environment because we need to update one version of something that's bash? That seems like it's a bit overkill. Um, do we go and change it manually on all those systems? Now we start to deviate. Um, so it's a slippery slope there. So I think there's some interesting things to be decided there. Uh, that's the technology portion. Quickly going on to culture, uh, really, DevOps is more than just using whatever the tool of the day is, the new hotness. Automation is a key component, but it's just a component in getting it right, and really it's people. Uh, and it's, it's actually using your brain, thinking about some of these things, and working with people to, to get this done. That's, that's where the real fun and hard part is. The technology is really simple. Um, DevOps is really, it's a culture in which people work together to improve the product delivery cycle. From near, he's a guy that in the DevOps, he's, he's a bit contrarian, but I think he also, he just has very insightful um, quips that he throws out there of, of what he believes this movement is. Uh, but these are all things that come back to, these are the same principles we saw, or closely related to things that are in the Agile Manifesto. We see people, we see collaboration, we see iteration. Um, it's just that we're doing it now, we're taking it, not just from the customer to the product, the product owner to the developer, but from the developer to operations and running the product. So it's a natural progression. Um, culture, people who have been in the agile world have a definition of done done, um, accepted by the product owner or shippable. That doesn't fly anymore. Uh, you own it all the way through. So it's deliverable to operate in production as designed. And when it doesn't operate, you're the one that gets called. You're the one that's on call. You support it, you fix it. Um, it's no longer the throw it over the wall to an ops team and they try to fight the fire and then they call you as a last resort. Uh, I also think that really the notion of a guard versus a coach is pretty important. That we were all developers first. Um, we maybe hacked on Linux boxes, but we were not sysadmins. Uh, having someone in our group who was the basket <coughs> operator from hell who knew how things should work and, and all the detailed ins and outs of the Unix kernel and whatnot isn't actually what you need to do this. It, running it, you've got enough information that you can Google, and really these processes are what we do as developers anyways. Um, you're going to expand your horizons and you're going to get to learn a little bit more about the operating system and the servers. But we really just need to have somebody who was there championing and saying, yeah, this is working, this is the way to go, not someone who was a sysadmin type person who was saying, oh, that's not the way that you install that. Um, because we were already somewhat uncomfortable being in this new area, and we wanted to be able to make mistakes and learn from them and correct them. And so that environment that was supportive of a coach was really important. Uh, coming back to Shellshock, really this tool is only 10%. Uh, the guy who found that, he, he would just happened to be after dinner, was sitting at home reading Pars Technica, and he came across that and it was, his first thought was, are we vulnerable? And so he logged in, ran the commands, and saw, hey, yeah, we are, what, what do we have to do? Um, again, it's that accountability and ownership extending straight into the production environment, not saying, hey, I'm gonna to wonder tomorrow, I'll see if somebody else is taking care of it, or somebody in security or IT ops. Uh, it was actually logging in and checking it and finding out for himself. Uh, that's, that's really different. Uh, and it's, it's something that uh, I think we've done a lot with retrospectives and five whys routinely, and it makes it a safe environment for people to run with the best intentions and learn. And it's now sitting in that people see something and they run with it and they think it's important. And try to fix it and address it and deal with it. Uh, that's really a mentality shift in a team that was afraid to press the release button a couple years ago.
years ago. Uh, Jenkins, I can't say enough. If there was a Church of Agile, I would not be there. Church of Jenkins of Automation, I might be found there uh, because it saves you time. Uh, everyone in our company uses Jenkins. We automate all of the things. Uh, finance gets quarterly and monthly reports. Marketing, they've got crazy queries that they want to run. Uh, support, it's self-serve that they can get it. It's, it's changed dramatically because instead of a support person coming to me and saying, hey Chuck, can you go and run that query that gives me the tax report for this business because I'm having a problem and I need to troubleshoot it? They don't ask that anymore. They say, can you write a Jenkins job so that I can get the tax report for this customer? Implicitly mean, and for every other customer in the future, that 15 minutes that I spend on writing the Jenkins job and empowering them means they don't come to me to ask for that problem again, uh, or for, for help with that one again. They can self-serve, uh, helps our customers. So really, it turns around things great that we said, you know what, it's an internal tool for our people that see it. Jenkins is not a beautiful UI. It doesn't have to be Jenkins, it can be an ECI server, but the fact that it isn't an elegant UI is far better than whatever crappy developer art we would have written in an app that we would have built, to be honest, because it's not our full-time job to be thinking about these internal tools. We just want the data serviced. That's what's important. They only want the data serviced. They're, they're internal. They don't care about how nice it looks. Um, but that's been important in how, I think, just the culture of get everything automated. It now expands beyond just the development team. I mean, we're actually talking about our marketing team is thinking that maybe they should write Markdown and commit to get repos so that they can push uh, updates to the web. Our marketing team. Uh, we, we approach the subject and, and they understand how we can roll forward, roll back. Uh, it's really started to have a pervasive effect on the attitude throughout the company. Um, and so finally, uh, technology, culture, and really, it's there's big A cap or big A little A agile. Uh, I think there probably is big D little D DevOps. Uh, it's really follow the core principles, iterate, and make it work for you. Again, that uh, that notion of going in the right direction towards perfection is what's most important because nobody can prescribe what you need for your environment. Nobody here would have thought that we had this terrible environment at Cashew. Uh, to be able to prescribe out exactly what we need. I can't say anything about your environment. I can tell you what we did, and you can hopefully take some insights from it, but uh, my biggest fear is that somebody is going to start offering enterprise DevOps certification. Uh, mm -hmm. That just is gonna show that, again, this is something else that the consultants have taken. There's been a movement from us to do something very good and try to prescribe it and make money off of it. That's not where the value is. The value is really how it changes your team. Um, so that's the recollection of the cash journey, what was right for us. We've come a long, long way. If you're interested in more uh, DevOps, DevOps Days Vancouver for anybody who's local is coming in uh, November. And you can learn more about Cashew there or from me. If there's any questions, take them back. Uh, so uh I understand that there are some tasks which developers still take care of, for example, creating a new recipe uh, for chief or a Jenkins job, like you described for customer service. Who taking care of maintaining uh, those things? Because Jenkins jobs have to be cleaned up and some of them are big. Same with tests, same with, I assume, uh, chief recipes. It's part of part of the ongoing process. I mean, it's, it's, it is the development team. So uh, Jenkins jobs, we've actually, Excuse me, we've actually just uh, had some stories that we put onto our board. We've got a ops board that's a kind of a Kanban board that we are on full time, but we, we, we maintain a backlog of tickets there, of things that maybe we need to do some Jenkins cleanup, maybe we need to do some upgrades of components in the infrastructure. They go into there, they get worked, and it handled just like everything else. They, we, the, the, the reality is we have taken on more capacity. We, there's more work that we need to do because we are doing this. Uh, it was kind of just ignored before, uh, and that didn't get us to a good place. So we have additional bandwidth and capacity, it's just that we don't have an ops team or one person that it all gets channeled through, and everybody knows how to do it. Uh, there are people that, that being said, though, there are people, the iOS guys, they're not generally in chef recipes, um, but anybody who's touching the server side code that runs there, um, 
they have probably touched it. There's a few that touch it more frequently than others. Sorry, how many of these three years have supported them? Like, it seems like, or if they're saying, you know, there's a, you know, the wrong old people have dropped over, or, you know, like, or what's the risk now? Because blah, blah, blah. Like, it seems like everybody's still supporting it, not just the system I mean. So we don't have a system okay. So it is everybody that supports it. Uh, we've got lots of automation and tools and services that help us identify exactly what is wrong so that we can respond quickly. I didn't really, one of the things that people talk about in DevOps quite frequently is, is on-call rotation and support duty and that. I didn't really go into that. We don't have something that's super formalized, to be honest. Uh, everybody does get the alerts, uh, but there's, we're a bit more ad hoc. We let each other know when people are going to be out of town or on vacation, um, but we don't have something that's a super critical um, that you're carrying a, a pager. Uh, but it's, it seems to work because we everybody is responsive. And if I'm on, say, hey, I've got it. Everybody else goes back to what they were doing. If someone else, uh, if I don't have it, someone else will come on and take it. There has been some discussion of you know what maybe that needs to be a bit more formalized so that you know who is really on call. It could be a problem. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we have a lot of trust in our people, but uh, I think that's a far better way fail rather than you fail already if you don't think you can trust the people that you work with. Um, there's 22 of us. We've got controls in place. There's certain, there's not everybody has access to everything. Um, but in general, we err on the side of trust. Um, but it's a, it's, we're a small company, small team, and we've met people pretty well. And you do earn your way into getting those credentials. Um, but the number of times that I've been other places, and I could have fixed the problem in an outage, a complete site outage went on because I couldn't do something. It's, it just doesn't fit with the philosophy that we've got of we take accountability and ownership. And with that, you get some power. And with great power comes great responsibility. So I think it's, it's largely cultural. Yeah? So if you had to step back into some place where they had an ops team and you know, there were those silos, what would you use to break that kind of stuff down? Uh, go sit at the ops guy desk and ask him if you can do the deploy. Uh, and it, it, this was actually how we started doing it in orbits. I sat with Carl one day and said, how do you deploy it? And, and asked him to write it down. He wrote down like seven things. And I tried to do the first one and it was okay. And went to go to the second one. He's like, oh no, no, you got to do these three things too. And we got all this stuff out of Carl's head. Uh, going and sitting with those guys is an absolutely illuminating experience. Uh, and you will learn how painful we as developers have made their lives. Uh, I, I will side with an ops guy after seeing some of the things that, that we've put them through, probably nine times out of 10 that blame the developer. We, we do not make their lives easy. You will learn a great deal of empathy and see how certain decisions you make as a developer just wreak havoc in their world. Yeah. One question on the on automated testing in terms of test coverage or ensuring the test coverage is adequate for not breaking not breaking on its own. How much overhead are you putting into maintaining that? Uh, so it's interesting. Uh, in you mean with specific to Chef and the infrastructure, or just in general? Just in general, of, yeah, the coverage of automated. Uh, so with this latest version of Chef, we initially started out only using the um, uh, server spec and uh, the, the full integration test. It's what would happen on every single commit. We would actually spin up nodes, fully converge, and check the test. That's what that test runs. We found that that was, one, wasting resources, and then we're spinning up nodes all the time. Um, and there, we could get a lot more out of the unit tests. And so we have focus there, and we've actually converted most of our stuff over to that. We keep those tests, and we have a few of them, but they only run once a day now. Um, it just 
wasn't giving us any value. There's been a question, do we drop that entirely? Maybe there is something, this is infrastructure spinning it all up, seeing that it all works. There is some, some, some faith in that and see that that comes together that is good. Um, so I, th I think it comes back to the same with unit testing in, in Java. Do you need to unit test a getter setter? If it truly is a getter setter and there's not complex logic that's going on, let's not think about that. It's, it's test pragmatically. Um, and I think that we, we, don't, we don't do things like having a test coverage graph that drives that we need to have more test coverage. It's, we hire smart people, we trust each other and respect each other enough to not screw things up and take shortcuts there. Uh, it might be the last question, but yeah. Uh, have you actually started implementing the feature flagging and what's your experience with it so far? Yeah. <coughs> uh, we do, but it's on a it's on a, it's not on the way that most people think about it because we actually built our own billing engine that manages all our subscription management and all these various things. And so we're able to put people on a subscription plan that enable specific features. And so we will go and turn on that, that feature there. And it's not really the notion to hear about with Facebook or there's a couple of uh, Fet Life here in town. I think they basically have something that a feature flag gets turned on at 10% and then it will slowly roll out. We have none of that sophistication. It's something that's far more manual. That's why I think it's the next step. I think we are now finally in a place that we've got a solid enough foundation that we can start to embrace that. And before that was just unicorns and rainbows. It seems kind of like that is the way it is. It seems to work for a lot of people. It does. Uh, I don't know that I would actually, like Netflix talks about having uh, how ever many features and tests going at a time. Uh, it's combining a couple of things there. I can see where it gets a little bit complex, um, but I, there's, there's something there to being able to get learning, having something turned on and getting a few people on it and getting some feedback that fits into that type of feedback loop that I really am a fan of. And so we're gonna experiment with a bit more. I don't know what our implementation is gonna be, to be honest. It'll probably be something pretty Lightweight, pretty manual almost to begin with, and then we'll see if it's paying dividends and then we'll put more automation into it. Awesome. Thank you, everybody, for your time.